Hi, I'm Jack Lynch and welcome to my workbench. We're here to do part two of figure painting. In part one we discussed preparing your figure, cleaning it up, priming it, discussed paints and so forth, tools. This time we're going to discuss some basic concepts and theories involved in figure painting. Um, these are really important concepts and they are basically the bedrock of what you're going to do. You, you need to take this in and think about it and use it to create your figure, to put the highlights and shadows and things on your figure. Very important. Basically figure painting is a, a two-part process. It's uh, figuring out where the colors go on your figure and putting them there. So it, it sounds easy just putting your colors on, but it's not that simple. We're, we're going to do supplementary highlights and shadows on the figure to create shape and to create depth. Now you'd say, why do we have to do this? Isn't the room light enough to cast shadows on the figure and make it look real? Well, it's not. Uh, unfortunately, it's not. <clears throat> what you have to do is you have to consider the size of the figure. The size of the figure is a shrunken down human. Now, we've shrunken the size of the human figure down, but we haven't shrunken the light source. And the room light isn't quite enough to pick up the tiny shadows and details that are on a figure. So we have to supplement the room light and make it more intense by adding shadows and highlights on the figure. So how do you determine where the highlights and the shadows go on a figure? Well, there's two types of shadows. There's direct shadows, which are cast from the sun down on an object and it casts a shadow. And then there's indirect shadows. Indirect shadows are what we're going to work with. That's ambient light all around you casting light on your clothing and your, your body so it creates highlights and shadows indirectly. Before moving on to mixing colors, I wanted to talk for just a minute about supplementary shadows and highlights because that's really um, what you need to think about and how you need to analyze your figure. And we're relating it to figures in these videos. We're taking a figure and we're planning out where to put shadows and highlights, adding them in, blending them, and we'll get to that when we get into mixing colors next. But I wanted to point out that it's not just figure models that you can do this with. Um, if you build a tank model, this is a T-34 that I built for demo purposes at AAA Hobbies, and I've added shadows where all the armor angles meet and there's crevices and corners, and then I put highlights on the flat surfaces on the top, airbrushed it on. They call it color modulation, I call it highlighting and shadowing, supplementary highlights, supplementary shadows. Same thing with aircraft models. Take something like this, this is a Corsair, a 32 scale Corsair. You can't see a lot in the dark here, but when I flip this over and you look at the bottom, you can see where I've painted in all the supplementary shadows and highlighted so that when this thing's you're looking at, it, you can you can get a definite shape out of that. You can see shapes. So that's the goal. The goal is to add supplementary highlights and shadows so that we can see the shapes from far away. So how do I figure out where the indirect shadows and highlights fall on a figure? The best thing that you can do is prime your figure gray. I always use gray because I think it casts better shadows. But what you want to do is you want to take your figure and put it under a light source. You know, I've got a lamp here. You could have a fluorescent lamp, whatever lamp you want. But take your figure and hold it about a foot under the, the light source and slightly tilt it about a 60 degree angle. And you can look and you can see where all the highlights and all the shadow lines fall on this figure. So basically what you want to do is take the unpainted figure I've got it right here, and you can see I'm using a figure that has a lot of texture to it. It has a lot of clothing and a lot of cloth and so forth. So even without the light directly over it, you can kind of see where the, the dark shadows fall and the highlights and so forth. But when you put it under a light source, you're really going to see it. And what you want to do is study it. In other words, look it over and make sure you kind of understand where these lights and shadows are falling on the figure. And what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about probably the most important rule in figure painting that applies to highlights and shadows, and that's called the stop sign rule. Okay, so let me grab my little whiteboard here, and we'll talk about the stop sign rule. The stop sign rule basically is kind of what it sounds like. You draw yourself a stop sign, you know, an eight-sided octagonal shape, and then what you do is you look at these, and you have to relate this to color theory. In other words, when a highlight drops down upon a shape, it leaves shadows and highlights. So if we number the sides of this, number one, number two, number three, number four, and number five, going from lightest to darkest, 
you'll get an idea. In other words, picture light shining down on this octagonal shape or the cylinder, this eight-sided cylinder. And when the light hits it, number one, the surface number one is the lightest color. Number two is a little darker. Three is usually the base color. Four is a dark shadow. And five is the darkest where the light hardly touches it at all. So remember this shape and then think about a fold of clothing, let's say going over that shape. And this is a fold on your sleeve. If you look at my sleeve, it's one of the folds that comes out. You'll note that the highlight color would probably be like here. And then number two would be here. Number three would be the side. Number four would be going under and five would be the darkest point. So this would be a shadow and a highlight on a sleeve. In other words, bring it out and just match the shape to the shape of the, the sleeve or, or the wrinkle in the sleeve. So <clears throat> the stop sign rule is, is hugely important. It tells you where to lay the colors. And when I get into color mixing next, we'll talk a little bit more about this. We'll talk about the stop sign rule and putting the colors on here. And then you'll note, this is five different colors, basically. And you're putting each one on. You're not mixing them together. You're going to go back and you're going to blend in between them. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Let's talk about color mixing in relation to the stop sign rule. So we basically, we've looked at the stop sign rule, which tells us where the highest highlights and the darkest shadows fall on a surface. And... What I'd like to show you is how you're going to mix your colors to correspond to that stop sign rule. So in other words, we have one, two, three, four, five surfaces or colors to deal with. In other words, each color we put on the figure, we can have a possible five different shades of that color. Now, I've listed them out here, and obviously it's black and white here, <clears throat> so you can't see the difference in the colors. But if you look at this, there are numbers up here one, two, three, four, five, that go from lightest to darkest. And what we'll do is when we mix a color, we'll start with the base color, and then we'll mix a medium shadow and a dark shadow and a medium highlight and a high highlight or a very light highlight here. So you'll have lightest, medium, the base, the medium shadow, the darkest color, and these five colors, one, two, three, four, five, will correspond to the stop sign rule. In other words, number one is the highest highlight. Number two is the medium highlight. Number three is your base color. Number four is a medium shadow. And five is the darkest shadow. So it's pretty simple. And what I'll do now is we'll talk just for a minute about actually mixing colors and take a look at that. And you'll get an idea what this is about. When you're painting figures, it really does help to have an understanding of color mixing or color theory. And Basically, to bring it down to the bottom level, you need to understand that there's three primary colors. That means there's three colors that you cannot get by mixing other colors together. That would be red, yellow, and blue. They are the primaries. They are colors that can't be duplicated by mixing other colors. You create secondary colors by mixing those two of those primaries together. In other words, if I mix yellow and blue, I get green. If I mix red and blue, I get violet. If I mix red and yellow, I get orange. So that's the second ring of the color wheel. Third ring of the color wheel, and, and on and on, is tertiary colors, which are created by mixing all three of the primaries in different amounts and different ratios. So I would recommend getting a hold of a color wheel and just familiarizing yourself with that. And what's great about that is, if you use oil paints like I do to paint over acrylics, if you have a basic set of oil colors, red, yellow, blue, the primaries, black and white, and maybe a few other colors that we use for flesh like burnt sienna um, and yellow ochre, you have every color in the rainbow at your disposal. You can mix just about anything. And I'm not a color expert and my eye for color isn't as good as some people, but there's a lot of resource out there. You can go to the internet and look up mixes for oil colors. You can get some literature and look up mixing colors. So there's, there's a lot of information out there that'll help you. So my first step, after I've got my figure primed, I've got the acrylic coat on it, I get the colors that I need. And in this case, I'm gonna mix um, a brown color for the jacket on this figure. So I grabbed red, yellow, and black. Why did I grab those? Because I know 
that, that those are the colors I need. And I looked it up and I've experimented a little bit. And the second thing I do is I get my reference material together. In this case, this is uh, the Battle of the Bulge figure with his brown Mackinac overcoat on. And I grabbed a set of figures because they have really nice artwork on it that has really good color um, representation. Plus, I grabbed one of the books I have in my library about U.S. infantry uniforms. So, I'll get my reference material. <clears throat> I'll get my three tubes of oil paint. I've got my figure. And I'll go on from there. We've talked about the stop sign rule, we've talked about color mixing and how they relate to each other, and it's important to think about a color chart. In other words, think of it as a shading color chart where your base color of your uniform or your flesh tone is always in the middle, and there's five colors. So you're going to go, base color is number three, and then you're going to go up to high, a highlight and a higher highlight, and you're going to go down to. A shadow and a deeper shadow so there's always five colors base coat two up two down that applies to uniforms it applies to flesh tones and so forth and no matter what kind of paint you use keep this theory in mind I always like I say I put my base coat down as an acrylic paint I use acrylic paint and I mix my base color in oil paint to match what's on there in the acrylic color so that when I blend if I break through the blend the color underneath won't be disturbed and it, it won't show. Um, we'll talk about that later, but always keep in mind, no matter what kind of paint you use, you want to go base high higher, base dark darker, okay? And relate it to the stop sign rule, numbers one through five. This also applies to flesh tones, which we'll talk about in part three of our series. <music> Thank you.